Welcome to Reframing the World with Douglas J. Boggs. Today we will be doing a book read of a chapter from my book Quantum of Justice. On the printed edition, it starts on page 302. On the ebook, it starts on page 316. And it is the chapter The Making of Senate Bill 1638 to Amend California Civil Code 2934A. This was an integral part of my lawsuit against Wells Fargo Bank for fraud. This chapter outlines exactly and specifically why we have such fraud and corruption in our judicial system today in reference to fraudulent foreclosures. Enjoy. The Making of Senate Bill 1638 to Amend California Civil Code 2934A. The history of property recordation takes us back to the Greeks. Our more modern means and standardized processes come out of Old English common law and the statute of frauds. This has been a rule since 1677, and still is valid law throughout the United States today. It requires that all real property contract agreements, such as leases to sales and conveyances of transfer, were to be in writing, dated and signed by all parties involved in the contract agreement. The purpose of the law was to help eliminate the fraudulent practices that many people had been attempting. It helped to prevent perjury and gave the courts of the day more information with which to adjudicate land title disputes. It also helped to stabilize true land prices of the day, creating a valuable and appreciable asset for the title holder. The monarchies had found a way to appreciate and control assets of their holdings through their ability to trade and sell a property with a legal value. The landholders with more grand estates held the keys to the kingdom, although the commoner began to feel the stability of being a landowner. Society was coming out of the feudal period when rich landholding monarchs owned the property and had serfs working the land. Serfs is a term used for someone who works a piece of land for someone else but is given a stipend to survive and food to eat. Gradually, privately held real estate began to take hold, as there were little to no standing armies during this time outside of the monarchies, such as the French and English and a few others. For landholders to protect their land, they would have to travel away from their property and families to fight for their rights and freedoms. When they left to head off to battle, the landholders would leave their property in the care of a friend who had gone to battle. The statute of frauds created a set of written documents that held a legal standing for someone to prove their ownership of a parcel of land. Eventually, a notary became commonplace as a means of true legal assurance through the act of notarization of the documents. This action would simplify the legal verification that all parties who signed the documents were the true and correct persons who were party to the contract. Without a set of these documents, no one in their right mind would want to invest in property as as anyone could come in and claim it to be their own. This means of a legal binding document was necessary to possess in such a developing world as it showed the accurate property recordation of the landowner and who was the true title holder. California became part of the United States after being admitted to the Union on September 9 in 1850. Coming straight out of the gold rush, California quickly became a leader in legislation for real estate issues. One of the very first acts that the legislature of the new state named California performed was to adopt a recording system in order to create public notice or evidence of title or interest in the title, which could be conveniently collected and maintained in a safe public place. The intent behind the idea of this recording system was to inform interested parties planning to purchase or otherwise deal with land about the ownership and the condition of the title. California has a long 170-year history of the way its courts have applied legal principles regarding the title to real property and the conveyance and transfer of the title. The development and evolution of these principles also apply to encumbering a title to real property through mortgages or deeds of trust and to provide notice of and to evidence monetary claims against the title in the form of liens. This history is documented by the creation of constitutional provisions and statutes and subsequently by a long line of case law. 
in the absence of some specifically applicable constitutional or statutory provisions, the common law, case law, prevails. The design of the system was to protect lenders and purchasers against secret or private party sales, transfers, or conveyances, and from undisclosed encumbrances and liens. The purpose of this system is to allow the title to the real property to be freely transferable. The California legislature adopted a recording system modeled after the system established by the original American colonies. It was strictly an American device for safeguarding the ownership of and the encumbering of land and property. Recording of sales, transfers, or conveyances and encumbrances and liens as part of a public record was established to impart constructive notice. This system of recording is known as the Race Recording, or as the Race Notice Recording Statute Law. California got its basic principles of law governing title to real property from England's common law, which has been generally implemented by case law known as stare decisis. Stare decisis is a Latin phrase that means to stand by a decision. As it is applied, stare decisis is a doctrine to bind a trial court by higher court decisions, such as appellate and Supreme Court decisions that become precedents on a legal question raised in the lower trial court. Reliance on such precedents is required of lower courts until a higher court changes the rule. So not only does our judicial system have a set of rules or laws as they are created by the legislature, but those rules, those laws that the legislature has created are then interpreted by lawyers and judges in every case brought to court. Lawyers attempt to litigate their arguments in their case in a way that will best serve their client's side of the story. They do this by interpreting the intent of the rule of law, or the intent with which the legislature was acting when they voted on a specific rule of law. Or this was true of the intent of the society in which the law was originally written, and how that intent might reflect on how our society is today. The lawyers argue about the intent of the wording of the law to the court, and the judge then takes this argument into consideration in his or her ruling, based on the arguments and the existing rule of law and precedents set since the law was put on the books. This means that the law isn't simply the law as it is written, but it must also deal with the intent of the legislature and the judge's perceptions of the intent, along with the precedents that have become part and parcel of the framework of the original law as it was written. The one thing that is true about the making of a bill into a law is that it takes a lot of time, taxpayers' dollars, and many different people to orchestrate the entire bill into becoming a law or an amendment to an existing law. There are numerous legal and legislative channels that must be dealt with, and in each of those channels there can be compromising opinions and views that create hurdles for the parties who are interested in finally getting the bill to the floor for its legislative vote. The parties involved want to make sure that, after all the time and money spent on the preparation of the bill to reaching its voting day, the proposal passes and the bill's constructors find the sense of victory and success of their bill becoming law. The story behind Senate Bill 1638 began in the year 1984. It was more than a decade prior to the conception of Bill 1638, but the wheels began turning to create the chaos of what was to come. In February of 1996, attorneys Michael J. Arnold and Christian E. Foy, on behalf of the Mortgage Association of California, wrote a statement of support for Senate Bill 1638. The Mortgage Association of California sponsored the bill, which Senator Ross Johnson of La Habra in Orange County, California, supported. Johnson and his staff worked on this issue for months before the senator took the bill's third draft and amended form to the floor for a vote. The background of the bill held to the premise that the bill would be specific to what was known as multi-lender loans or loans that had more than one, but as many as 10 different lenders that would be involved in one specific real estate transaction. In July of 1982, the California Department of Corporations adopted a regulation called the Multi-Lender Rule. This regulation was known as Regulation 260.1. 105.30. 
and it permitted mortgage brokers to arrange loans involving up to 10 private investors. This multi-lender rule became increasingly important to the brokerage and lending industries as the price of real estate continued to rise to a point where most larger loans were being conducted using multiple lenders. This new rule allowed the investors to spread their risk by investing their capital in a series of loans rather than having to commit such a large portion of their investment capital to only one loan. In subsequent years, this rule soon became a mainstay to the brokerage borrowing and lending industries. The problem, claimed by the Mortgage Association of California who sponsored the bill, that seemed to be arising in the real estate industry was that the prices across the board for real estate were rising dramatically. So much so that there were more and more transactions needing multiple investors to make the transaction work. In nearly all multiple lender transactions, the appointment of a trustee was involved. The appointment of a trustee is an integral part of any note using a deed of trust, as well as being a vital part of any transaction using multiple lenders. The trustee is empowered to take action on behalf of the multiple beneficiaries in the event of a foreclosure. It is also the trustee's position to make sure that the rules and regulations of the lenders are followed in accordance with the rules of law to protect the borrower's title against any wrongdoing on behalf of the beneficiary. There are various circumstances that might arise in which a substitution of the trustee is either desired or necessary. As an example, the original trustee named in the deed of trust might no longer be in business, or the lender was elected to change the servicing agent, and the servicing agent might prefer to use a trustee with which they, they're more familiar and have done business with previously. Under the current law at that time, the substitution of a new trustee required the written approval from each of the investors. The reason for all this is that this is basic contract law. It is imperative that all parties to the transaction must be informed of any changes to the contract agreement, not simply the beneficiaries. However, it seemed that the Mortgage Association of California wanted the wording to specify beneficiary and have no mention of the borrower or trustor having any needs or protections allotted them by the trustee in the transaction. Their position was solely on behalf of the lenders, so much so that they went on to state that obtaining the required approval is frequently difficult and time-consuming. An example they used was that one of the investors may be away for an extended vacation, medically incapacitated, or be unreachable for other reasons. Additionally, they claimed there had been instances where a small investor in a multi-lender transaction would demand that he or she be paid in full before agreeing to allow substitution of the new trustee. It was also their claim that it was frequently essential that a new trustee be appointed expeditiously to accomplish foreclosure proceedings or to take other appropriate action in connection with the protection of the interests of the beneficiaries. The Mortgage Association of California seemed to have the solution. In February of 1996, Senator Ross Johnson began backing a new bill, Senate Bill 1638, or known as SB 1638, which was sponsored by the Mortgage Association of California. The requirement at that time was that there needed to be a 100% approval from the beneficiaries. This, according to Michael J. Arnold and Christian E. Foy, on behalf of the Mortgage Association of California, was that this was costly, time-consuming, and created the opportunity for one investor to take advantage of the others by withholding consent until others, other demands were met. Moreover, it gave equal power to all beneficiaries in the transaction. It was therefore the intention of the new bill, SB 1638, to redistribute that power to the largest investor in the transaction and strip away any power and position to the lesser investors in the transaction. So this new bill would permit the substitution of a new trustee under a multi-lender transaction with the approval of beneficiaries holding a majority interest, more than 50%, in the note and the deed of trust. They claimed this was a fair proposal that would protect the interests of all multi-lender beneficiaries by allowing a new trustee to expeditiously execute the actions which were in the best interests of the note holders. It seemed in their position to the California Senate for SB 1638 that 
They appeared to have no regard for the welfare of the smaller investors in the multiple lender transaction, or the borrower's position, or of the protection of the borrower's title. However, a few months later, on April 17, 1996, Senator Ross Johnson received a letter from the Department of Corporations stating their opposition to this new proposed bill. The letter held the department's position to oppose the bill unless there were amendments, and until such time they would only remain neutral to the bill. It was the position of the Department of Corporations that SB 1638 sets forth procedures for substituting a trustee under a deed of trust upon real property in connection with multi-lender transactions that are exempt from qualification with the Commissioner of Corporations. Let's make note that all these proposals at this time were very clear in that the bill was being structured to deal with multi-lender transactions, and there was no mention of any need to change any rules or any reason that single-lender transactions were to be of any issue. The Department of Corporations went on to state, their concern that this bill had the potential to result in self-dealing and conflicts of interest. It was their position to name specifically real estate brokers in this concern, but we have now come to see that the concern held much merit. However, the parties of concern were the financial corporations themselves. The example used in their letter to Senator Johnson was that a broker or its affiliate holding 50% or more of the interest or notes may appoint itself as the trustee of the note and deed of trust. Let this sink in for a moment. The concern was clear from the beginning that this possibility could take place. The idea of corruption of a party holding a major interest in the note to make itself beneficiary and trustee to the transaction. Although at this time the concern was hidden in the rhetoric of a corrupt broker, we have come to experience this corruption head-on as corporations, more specifically financial corporations, are the main parties guilty of this action. Another example that the Department of Corporations cited was that the bill might create the potential for misappropriation of funds for the purpose of selling the property and receiving funds for distribution to investors. The department voiced their concern that they were unaware of any demonstrable evidence to support the need for this bill, nor was the department aware of any information to demonstrate for the lack of an existing trustee is a pervasive problem. In addition, a multi-lender transaction typically involves only 10 investors, so it begs the question whether it is difficult to obtain consent from such a small group. They went on to say that existing law already sets forth procedures for substituting a trustee without the need for a new code section. The new code section was unnecessary and confusing. In closing, however, the Department of Corporations added that Assuming there is justification to support this bill, the Department of Corporations recommends amendments to, number one, exclude the interest or notes held by a real estate broker or its affiliate from the provision that allows a majority interest to substitute a new trustee, or number two, conform the procedures for substituting a trustee to the provisions of the multi-lender rule, And number three, insert the amendments into an existing code section relating to substitution of trustee. The department attached the amendments that they referred to in their letter in legislative council format to make those changes easier for Senator Johnson to add into the wording of the bill. Through the submission of the Department of Corporations amendments, there was a rewrite of the proposed bill. This rewrite was sent to the Senate floor again for a vote on June 26, 1996. It was approved unanimously in a 33-0 vote. The summary of this bill addressed the substitution of trustees and collective decisions made by beneficiaries in the context of multi-lender transactions. I want to express the importance of that line in the summary. This bill was designed specifically for multi-lender transactions to help multiple lenders in a transaction eliminate the necessity for a unanimous agreement. It was not designed or put to the floor to be a part of the substitution of trustee in a single lender transaction. It was originally set up to clean up and streamline the multi-lender transactions needed to substitute a trustee. 
It would help to not restrict the ability of beneficiaries in MLTs, multi-lender transactions, to agree by contract to allow substitutions. It would allow a substitution by a simple majority or allow the larger stakeholders or those with 50% or more in the transaction to have more voice should all the investors be unavailable to make the substitution move forward. It did not require the beneficiaries in a MLT to have a unanimous consent for trustee substitution for other decisions. The one thing that struck me when I was reviewing the analysis to this bill, which was written by a lawyer named Carrie Lee Early, was her manipulation of the current law. The senators were reading this information and were basing their decisions on this information from a licensed attorney of the California State Bar who was to have known, understood, and educated the senators on the subject well enough for them to make informed decisions prior to their vote. No senator is knowledgeable on all the issues, rules of law, and other necessary policies that dictate the background of each bill that comes across the floor to a vote. These elected officials can be doctors, dentists, business persons, activists, or simply concerned citizens who are eventually elected to their positions. They are normal people who are relying on the information that is supplied in the analysis to help educate them on some of the issues pertaining to each individual proposed bill. The senators use this analysis to learn about the existing law and summary legal advice that is given to them by lawyers who are employed by the state legislature. Carrie Lee Early was an attorney for the Assembly Judiciary Committee. It was the Assembly Judiciary Committee's task to help clear up questions and to inform the senators of the nuances of the proposed bill or amended bill by constructing the analysis of the Mortgage Association of California who was sponsoring the bill being supported by Senator Johnson. In her analysis, there was a section titled Existing Law. The first section of this analysis read, number one, governs and defines right and duties of the parties to a deed of trust, which is a real property security device given to secure a payment of indebtedness. There are three types of party to a deed of trust. The trustor, mortgagor, and usually debtor. The trustee, title company, bank, and other person who holds the legal title with power to sell on default of the trustor and the beneficiary, creditor. As a practical matter, a DOT functions as a mortgage agreement containing a power of sale that allows the trustee to sell the property upon the default of the trustor. This procedure is known as a non-judicial foreclosure. Procedures for exercising the power of sale are set forth in statute. Foreclosure may also be obtained by a beneficiary through judicial foreclosure. Number two, allows the trustee identified in a deed of trust to be substituted by the recording of a document acknowledging the substitution by all the beneficiaries under the deed of trust. The substitution document must contain specific information, such as the date on which the underlying deed of trust was recorded and the name of the new trustee. Depending upon when the substitution is made, the beneficiaries may have to notify the trustee of record and those persons entitled to receive notice of default. And number three, does not restrict the ability of beneficiaries in MLTs to agree by contract to allow substitutions by a simple majority or to be governed by majority decisions with respect to other decisions, such as whether to foreclose. The background of the analysis states that the multi-lender rule exempts MLTs from certain securities regulations. MLTs are lending agreements secured by real estate that involve no more than 10 lenders and investors and beneficiaries. To qualify for the exemption, a MLT must comport with various rules pertaining to the mortgage broker's solicitation, the structuring of the loan, and the qualifications of the beneficiaries. The multi-lender rule states that the transaction documents must require that beneficiaries who hold 50% or more interest in the unpaid dollar amount of the applicable interest or votes may determine and direct the actions to be taken on behalf of all holders 
in the event of default or with respect to other matters requiring the direction or approval of the holders, and that they may designate the broker, servicing agent, or other person to so act on their behalf. The multi-lender rule has become important in recent years due to high real estate values and the need for larger loans by borrowers. The arguments in support attempt to make clear that according to the Mortgage Association of California, the bill's sponsor, that the bill is necessary to address situations in which the substitution of a trustee is necessary, but not all the beneficiaries, lenders and investors, in a multi-lender loan are readily available to authorize the substitution. For example, one of the investors may be away on an extended vacation, medically incapacitated, or simply unreachable for other reasons. The sponsor also states that there have been cases in which a small investor in a multi-lender transaction has demanded that he or she be paid before agreeing to allow substitution of a new trustee. In these examples, the current requirement for 100% approval from the beneficiaries is costly and time-consuming. There were never any arguments in opposition to this bill as its analysis was written in this manner. But what if it were written in a way that held true to the rule of law to allow the senators who were to vote on this bill to be given a more well-rounded depiction of the rule of law as it pertains to real estate and contract law? What if it were written in a way that gave the senators more detailed information on the legal statutes set forth by the California Supreme Court only eight years prior to the bill being pushed through the California Senate. It was in May of 1978, in Garfinkel v. Superior Court of Contra Costa County. The Supreme Court ruled through a unanimous view. In the opinion authored by Justice Manuel, Wiley W. Manuel, they were careful to include, quote, similarly... We are not convinced that the state has encouraged or facilitated non-judicial foreclosure by enacting comprehensive and detailed regulations governing that process. As we stated earlier, these statutory regulations were enacted primarily for the benefit of the trustor and for the greatest part limit the creditor's otherwise unrestricted exercise of the contractual power of sale upon default by the trustor." End quote. They knew and expressed their concern pertaining to the non-judicial foreclosure process and how it can act against the interest of the trustor, or more generally, the borrower and the title owner. They could envision the unrestricted exercise of the contractual power against the borrower in a non-judicial foreclosure action. This case specifically was in relation to the argument that Wells Fargo was attempting to present in my case, that the state or the federal courts had no jurisdiction in a non-judicial foreclosure action since there was a trustee involved, thereby creating a private action and contending that it did not satisfy the state action requirements of the due process clause of the state constitution. The court went on to clarify how a non-judicial foreclosure action did in fact satisfy the due process clause of the state constitution. However, they were careful to include wording stating that, quote, it cannot realistically be claimed that the state, by acting to protect the debtor, has hereby become the partner of the creditor, so that the creditor's actions are converted into the actions of the state. Barrera versus Security Building and Investment Corporation. In the 1978 Garfinkel versus Contra Costa County ruling, it was clearly stipulated by the unanimous opinion, and the intention of that ruling was made clear that, quote, the trustee has an independent duty as the common agent of the parties. See Ianza v. Mercantile Trust Company, 1917, and Pacific S&L Company v. North American, etc. Company, of 1940. Only seven years had passed when in August 1985 the Supreme Court of California heard IE Associates v. Safeco Title Insurance Company, this was also a unanimous decision with the opinion authored by Justice Kaus. It was in this decision that the details of a trustee were more narrowly defined, once again, as they cited in Garfinkel, merely contained the general statement that a trustee under an ordinary deed of trust is the common agent of both parties and is required to act impartially. 
The opinion of California's highest court went on to state, quote, In short, there is no authority for the proposition that a trustee under a deed of trust owes any duties with respect to exercise of the power of sale beyond those specified in the deed and the statutes. There are, moreover, persuasive policy reasons that militate against a judicial expansion of those duties. The non-judicial foreclosure statutes, an alternative to judicial foreclosure, reflect a carefully crafted balance of the interests of beneficiaries, trustors, and trustees. Beneficiaries, of course, want quick and inexpensive recovery of the amounts due under promissory notes in default. Trustors, on the other hand, need protection against the forfeiture of valuable property rights. Trustees, the middlemen, need to have clearly defined responsibilities to enable them to discharge their duties efficiently and to avoid embroiling the parties in time-consuming and costly litigation. In taking all these concerns into account, the statutes strike an overall balance favoring the protection of trustors. That's Garfinkel versus Superior Court of Contra Costa County. The legislature's decision not to require the trustee to search for the trustor's current address, but to compel him to use it if it is known, is consistent with this careful balancing of competing interests to maintain the overall working of the system under which a trustor should normally receive actual notice. The beneficiary ordinarily would know if a trustor had moved, and the statute requires him to notify the trustee of any new address he knows. The efficacy of the system supports striking the balance in favor of requiring the trustee to keep the beneficiary and trustee informed of his current address. It is a simple task for the trustor, whereas imposing on the trustee a duty of taking responsible steps to discover the trustor's current address would bring far more cost and uncertainty into the system. Litigation would be likely any time a person failed to receive actual notice, since one could always argue that the steps taken were insufficient. This wording clearly shows the intention of the Supreme Court of California to specify the independence of a trustee in a deed of trust agreement. The opinion talks of, quote, a carefully crafted balancing of the interests of beneficiaries, trustors, and trustees, end quote. Using the word middlemen and detailing the balance of interests by naming the three independent parties in a deed of trust agreement as the beneficiaries, trustors, and trustees, the detailed wording makes clear the independent position of the trustee in a deed of trust agreement. With all that said, this brings us back to the wording used by attorney Carrie Lee Early for the Assembly Judiciary Committee. Remember, that she cited in the existing law section of her analysis that, quote, there are three types of party to a deed of trust. The trustor, mortgagor, and also usually debtor. The trustee, title company, bank, or other person who holds the legal title with power to sell on default of the trustor. And the beneficiary, the creditor. So here was an attorney giving the legal advice in her analysis of the bill to the senators, many of whom may or may not be learned in the rule of law. In this, she states that the trustee can be a bank. This statement on its own might be true, but what she does not stipulate and clarify to the senators who might read her analysis is that the trustee cannot be the bank who is also the beneficiary to the deed of trust. This was never cleared and stipulated. The California Supreme Court has ruled with clarity that the trustee must be independent in a deed of trust agreement. The wording in the analysis did not clarify enough, which might have misrepresented the truth to the senators. Also, the analysis stated that the trustee was the party who holds the legal title with power to sell on default. The misrepresentation here is the wording that the trustee holds legal title. The trustee holds title on behalf of the title owner, who is the trustor. The trustee does not hold legal title whatsoever. The Supreme Court was clear in this when they wrote their concern on this specific issue, 
Quote, In short, there is no authority for the proposition that a trustee under a deed of trust owes any duties with respect to exercise of the power of sale beyond those specified in the deed and the statutes. End quote. Their intention in the 1985 ruling was to build more defined clarity as to the position of the trustee. They were showing their concern about the necessity of the independence of the trustee and to not have the beneficiary and the trustee able to intermingle their positions as it would clearly inflict on the rights of the 14th Amendment of the Constitution of the United States. Quote, The 14th Amendment prohibits the state from depriving any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, but it adds nothing to the rights of one citizen as against another. The United States versus Cruikshank, 1875. In the IE Associates versus Safeco Title Insurance Company of 1985 ruling, the Supreme Court wanted to give more detail and specificity to the position of the trustee than the held and quoted previous ruling from Garfinkel versus Contra Costa County of 1978. They were expressing their concern for the delicacy of the situation to make sure that the expansion of the power of the trustee is held in check. This was noted specifically to protect the title and the trustor, who is the owner of the title. If the beneficiary is also able to act as the trustee, then there is no separation of the parties, no independence of the trustee, and therefore the idea of a true deed of trust as defined by the California Supreme Court is in fact a falsity. Once you see behind the proverbial curtain, you will find that it's actually all quite simple, but so corrupt. Why do we call it a justice system when justice is gone? Why do we call it a trustee when it is in fact a straw man? Why do we call it a deed of trust when there is no trust involved? Why do we call it a non-judicial foreclosure procedure when the courts are partisan to the fraud? Perhaps it is called non-judicial because you will never find true justice. It all comes down to this. The banks are incapable of proving that the trustee is in fact independent in the deed of trust contract that the bank used as the instrument to attach the home as collateral against the mortgage. The bank is incapable of proving that the trustee has the power to protect the homeowner from any wrongdoing by the bank during the life of the deed of trust contract as described by the need for the trustee to be recognized as an independent party to the deed of trust transaction. If the banks are unable to prove the independence of the trustee in a deed of trust agreement, then they are in fact committing fraud when using a deed of trust agreement, when they do not inform the borrower of the fact that the trustee is not independent and is incapable of looking out for the best interests of the borrower in the deed of trust. If the bank uses a deed of trust agreement, knowing that the trustee is not independent, as described by the California Supreme Court in 1978, Garfinkel v. Superior Court of Contra Costa County, they are in fact committing fraud against the borrower at the inception of the contract, which makes the contract in fact void. Because the bank knows they are in control of the trustee in a non-judicial foreclosure action, They can foreclose on anyone, anytime, anywhere, whether they have a mortgage or have even paid cash for their property. Because the banks know that they have the power to replace the trustee at any time for any reason they see fit, they know that if they wish to, they can file fraudulent paperwork to the county recorder's office in a non-judicial foreclosure. Because there is no party looking out for the interest of the property owner, and the courts have handed over the justice system to the trustee in a non-judicial foreclosure action. Because the courts have entrusted the trustee, and the California Supreme Court has ruled that the trustee is to be independent in a deed of trust agreement, they have given the judicial power of correctness to all the documents that are filed into the court in a non-judicial foreclosure procedure. The reason the bank or other party can file whatever paperwork they choose in order to foreclose on someone is due to a 1998 rule that 
changed the rules to the power of sale clause. This rule comes from the 1996 Senate Bill 1638. Senate Bill 1638 reads as such. Senate Bill 1638, Johnson. Deeds of Trust. Trustee Substitution. Existing law sets forth the procedures for the substitution of trustees under a deed of trust upon real property or an estate for years therein. This bill would, as an alternative procedure, set forth the procedures for the substitution of trustee under a deed of trust upon real property or an estate for years, given to secure an obligation to pay money by the beneficiary or beneficiaries under the deed of trust who hold more than 50% of the record beneficial interest of a series of notes secured by the same real property or of undivided interest in a note secured by real property equivalent to a series transaction. The bill would also establish a process through which all the beneficiaries under a trust deed can agree to be governed by beneficiaries holding more than 50% of the record beneficial interest of a series of notes in real property or interest in a note equivalent to a series transaction as specified. In order to substitute trustees or agree to be governed by the majority interest holders, all parties to this transaction would be required to sign and record a document containing specified information. This rule gave the bank power to substitute a new trustee at the will of the bank. This removed the independence of the trustee, thereby destroying any semblance of law to the power of sale clause known as California Civil Code 2924. The use of a deed of trust contract without informing the borrower to the fact that the bank will have full control of their title as soon as they sign the contract is misrepresentation. This misrepresentation of the facts constitutes fraud, therein making any deed of trust agreement fraudulent on its face and therefore void, which makes every deed of trust agreement in the state of California since January 1, 1998, in fact, void. There have been some recent attempts to make changes to some California law regarding the exact issue that I was litigating in my case about the independence of a trustee. This new change is an attempt to create the facade that the trustee is independent, that the trustee can act as an independent fashion to guard any wrongdoing of the beneficiary to the trustor in a deed of trust contract. This does nothing to change the ruling of SB 1638, negating the independence of the trustee. What this does, though, is gloss over the insinuation that a trustee has independence, although there is a big difference between a trustee having the power to not accept appointment of the beneficiary as a new substituted trustee and the substituted trustee having absolutely no power to protect the borrower's title in a deed of trust agreement because of their lack of independence in the deed of trust agreement. Now I'm going to have you refer to the link, either on the screen or below, to review Senate Bill number. 306, Chapter 474. This is an act to amend Section 2934A of the Civil Code relating to mortgages. It was approved by the governor on October 2, 2019, and filed with the Secretary of State on October 2, 2019. Another recent change to the exact argument that I had in my unlawful detainer case was the primary argument of the bona fide purchaser. This has also been some obvious concern to the state legislature that they created Assembly Bill 354. This deals with the idea that the legal delineation of what it means to be an institutional investor. The very definition of this goes to the base arguments of being a bona fide purchaser in a foreclosure proceeding. The key takeaway from this is the legislative change to the definition of an institutional investor. It used to be a measure of how many transactions an investor, an investment group, corporation, or the like would do in a calendar year. This could help to define the knowledge base of that foreclosure purchaser. This knowledge base is also what helps to delineate what a bona fide purchaser is. It would be the reason someone might file a Liz Pendens 
to help stop an illegal foreclosure is to help weed out those who are innocent buyers to a tainted foreclosure property or those whose business it is to know all about the encumbrances to a foreclosure property. An institutional investor, no matter how many properties they purchase in a year, will no longer include a lien holder that acquires ownership of a single-family home through a judicial or non-judicial foreclosure. As many institutional investors purchase multi-unit property, it is a given that they are professional real estate investors. The definition of bona fide purchaser in a multi-unit property can be a little more easily defined based on the business model of the real estate itself. However, it is not a given. But now, the legislature has even deemed that a buyer of single-family home purchased through a judicial or non-judicial foreclosure will not be construed as an institutional investor and will therefore have the levity of being a bona fide purchaser in fact. The idea of corporate and institutional investing in real estate has been leveled. Again, follow the link on the screen or below, and you will find AB 354, Institutional Investors, which was amended August 17, 2018.